pointed out the sound of a particularly depressing pigeon. Now, Percy Thrower, I am not, but I'll give it a go. It made a kind of noise. Really, really depressing, unattractive sound. Point being, I'd never heard it before, but once it had been pointed out to me, I heard it everywhere. It was in my own garden, it was at work, it was on the way home from work. The thing seemed to be following me. And that happens in life, doesn't it? We're unaware of something until it's pointed out and then it seems to be crowding around us from all angles. The same is true of ideas as well as depressing pigeon sounds. For the last few films, maybe it's that crooked house debark at the start of the summer, but the idea of artificiality in aesthetics seems to be tracking me down, making me think about it. So it's no great surprise that here I am in Webley, showcase black and white village on the Herefordshire black and white village trail. Because here, it's anything but artificial. Surrounding us is the real thing. Just look at all these old dead trees. These timber frame constructions have warped and moved and sagged and settled into some sort of slumbering aesthetic ideal. When I lived in Park Village in Wolverhampton, there was a little bit of fake half timber, essentially a black piece of wood nailed onto a white panel of wood in an L shape, tacked onto an inexpensive sliver of Wolfroonian council house. Now nobody, when they drove past there, ever used to say, look at that. Everyone does when they drive through these villages. Is it that we sense innately the architectural fidelity, the historical fidelity of these places? Either way, it seems to be something that's embedded within us. We respond to these structures, not with a thrill, but with a sense of visual comfort, almost like we're eating fudge or hot buttered crumpet. And the existence of this black and white villages trail is testimony to that cosy consensus. It's a 40 mile clockwise mini road trip through the best that this part of England has to offer. A lot of people choose to start in Lemster, some at other points along the trail. You can make it bespoke however you want. I've started in Webley with its big explosive preponderance of timber framed fun. this little flash of red in an otherwise black and white world. It reminds me of the flash of red from the Doctor's gun in Alfred Hitchcock's black and white spellbound. A moment of sheer incongruous visual excitement.
was havering like mad this morning, looking at my little map on the desktop of the Herefordshire black and white trail and trying to decide which bits to snip off and which bits to grasp onto. And I'm sorry to say the Kinnersley got snipped off, but it doesn't matter because fluttering to the virtual floor, it raised itself back up again via the means of my subconscious because I have subconsciously, erroneously directed Mr. Harris back here without realizing it. And I'm glad I have. There's so many beautiful things to see here. The Smallman Monument behind us is not only a sumptuous piece of alabaster, it's also the reason that I forgot to look for the castle behind because me and my wife got so carried away arguing which child belonged to whom that, as I say, forgot to look for the enormous Jacobean castle behind. Not often that that happens, but we'll go and have a look in a minute and rectify that, okay? Actually, I've remembered now, it wasn't just the disagreement with my wife with regard to the Smallman Monument. It was the fact that I was indulging that childhood impulse that never leaves me when I'm in a graveyard, or a lot of other places for that matter, to look for slow worms. Anguis fragilis, the legless lizard, you know? No, never mind, okay? And so I think I was leaning down, foraging, foraging even through some... Uh, old stones or, or bits of compost and failed to turn around to see that. Quite a failure on my part. Actually, what's that behind those slates? around here, Kilpeck, Shobden, etc, etc. It's a 12th century cautionary tale of evil and vice, vigorously hewn into the stone, and staggeringly reminiscent of that wall-found fragment from Ulster, nearly 40 miles away. The font is the star of the show, of course, and it's perhaps a shame because perhaps many visitors never even penetrate this far into the chancel and they miss the strange, enigmatic Stephen's window. I couldn't find anything really about it when I tried to research it. Several members of the Stephen's family are commemorated and there's that little verse, O oh love that will not let me go. Simon Jenkins reckons it looks like Gilbert and George, but he's wrong. street past the accretion of black and white and subtle ochre and turn left and follow the streets up through the countryside until you come to the Erdisley Oak. It's 900 years old and there's loads of things that are brilliant about it. Firstly, it's stupendous age, the way that it dwarfs us and all our experiences. Secondly, the fact that other oaks of its type, like the major oak in Sherwood Forest, are cordoned off, supported, joisted. Tourist attractions like Stonehenge that you can't quite get near, they're a little out of reach. This is just in front of somebody's house. But the most obvious thing about it that's brilliant, adults might struggle with, 
but ask a child and they'll tell you straight away. You can get inside it. wide sloping green 14th century church and detached bell tower that gives other wide sloping greens 14th century churches and detached bell towers body dysmorphia. I'm a bit funny about ceaseless regular noise sometimes. I'm a bit funny about quite a few things but aren't we all? If I stay somewhere and there's a clock ticking in the night, or even worse, two clocks clicking out of sync with one another maddeningly. I have to find a towel, wrap them in, and stuff them in a wardrobe or a cupboard, hopefully remembering to tell the person I'm staying with where I put them. But there's something about that solemn, semi-solid, almost sacred metronomic tick within the bell tower that's anything but irritating. It's the sound of time, the sense in which we experience it as humans, lulling us into eternity amidst the massive oak and the sun dapples outside in the churchyard. I don't know about you, but I've only ever seen three kingfishers in real life, and only one really close up. It was here on my first visit, alighting on the banks in front of the Georgian dovecote, and although it was visually startling, it seemed entirely appropriate too, that this iridescent English ornithological exotica was alighting here, in a village that shares so many of its qualities. We know it's native and indigenous, but it outshines so much else that is both. And speaking of wholly explicable visual anachronisms, the 1920s AA kiosk, I think it's either the only surviving one or one of the only surviving ones. It was a, a little direct line to automotive assistance in those days somehow reminiscent of the Pillar of Salt in Bury St Edmunds. Maybe the font, maybe the usage itself, maybe the anachronism, who knows. How many of those would there have been in the country at one time then? 
have no idea, just like, you know, TARDIS style police call boxes, they were apparently re relatively uh, uh, commonplace, but like I say, you'll be unsurprised to hear. Just see a country full of those and blue phone boxes and red telephone boxes, well, you know. Yeah. Mm. I've yeah. never seen one of those, but then if it's the only one or one of the only ones, that makes sense. Sure does. So I've never been outside Wolverhampton. Most people finish the black and white trail back in Erdis land, but not me. I wouldn't be able to pass Shopton anyway on a normal day without popping in to have a look. But today of all days, and this summer of all summers when my mind has been so fully occupied by notions of building and rebuilding and fakery and authenticity, it seems absolutely emblematic of all of the above. There was a, a masterpiece of a 14th century church here, designed and carved by the same hand as carved Erdisley font. Testimony to the fact that it was a masterpiece is the re-erection of, of parts of the um, chancel up the hill a little bit, known as the, the Shobden Arches. And although they're weathered, as you'll see in a moment, they're still absolutely staggering works. Smash to pieces for this. John Bateman between 1749 and 1752 wiped the whole thing out, apart from the little fragment remaining up the hill, and built this. It's confusing, isn't it? Morally, aesthetically so. Because if you're gonna smash up one masterpiece to rebuild it with another masterpiece, where do notions of right and wrong fit? Because it is a masterpiece, isn't it? A complete Rococo masterpiece. I think pretty much unique in England. Horace Walpole style, Strawberry Hill Gothic. The Batemans were friends of, of Horace Walpole. Um, and it's, it's just perfection. Every lozenge, every arch, every detail of the pews, the galleries, the windows, is absolute joy but look what it replaced wherein does aesthetic truth lie <laughs> 